Hi, welcome to the presentation of the paper Masking and Fine-Grained Leakage Models, Construction, Implementation and Verification. I'm Marc Rochon, and this is a joint work with Gilles Barth, Benjamin Grégoire, Maximilian Ault, Clara Paglia-Longa and Lars Braun. This paper and the presentation are about masking and verification. Masking is a countermeasure against side channel attacks. And it's a great countermeasure because it comes with an information theoretical security guarantee, which allows to establish proofs that a certain algorithm is secure against side channel attacks, certain side channel attacks. And this allows to really rule out entire classes of side channel attacks, which is great because it provides a, a great um, resilience. Now, the problem is that every proof comes with an assumption. And in reality, these assumptions are often violated. An example is the leakage behavior, which is considered in the proof, and the leakage behavior, which is actually happening in reality on a real device. There, in reality, the leakage behavior, of a, which can be observed in the side channel attacks or exploited there, is much greater, much more diverse, and for example, and furthermore different than what is considered in the proofs. And this means that there is a gap between provable resilience and resilience in practice. And this gap is unfortunate because provable resilience is actually quite cool because it might rule out anti attack classes. Furthermore, an implementation uh, is, is challenging because we want to rely on provably secure algorithms, but we don't only want to implement them correct and secure, we want to furthermore harden them such that we achieve actual resilience in practice. That is, we always want to land in the green interval shown here. Um, in our, and this is very tedious to say. Um, implementing um, means that one has to come up with an implementation, measure, on a real device, perform test vector, leakage assessment, and so on. And this is very tedious and time consuming and really restricts the level of um, uh, creativity or optimizations we can explore because this is so tedious to perform and takes so much time. So in our work, we actually shrink the gap. We narrow the gap between provable resilience and resilience and practice, um, such that ver verification actually can deliver something to persons who want to uh, implement um, uh, masked algorithms on concrete hardware. We do this by performing the verification of masking security on concrete implementations to say executables and on assembly level. And we also consider the, the uh, leakage models which are much more fine-grained and are able to capture what is actually observable or leaking in practice. And as a last ingredient, we also perform this verification in stronger security definitions than we already have. Overall, this is very beneficial as it aids the construction and implementation of the masking countermeasure um, with the result of practical resilience in the end. And this not only at first order, but also at higher order. In this presentation, I will briefly go into hardened masking, then explain how we are actually able to make verification fine-grained leakage models possible and to automate the verification aspects there. And then in the end, I'm going to show how in our case study we were able to really efficiently harden and prison the S-Box and explore so many more optimization strategies that in the end, our second order present S-Box, which was hardened and practically resilient, was as fast as the naive strategy of composing gadgets, which are also hardened. But we actually had that both of them were as fast, that is, the second order was as fast in number of cycles than the first order implementation. So we were gaining essentially a, first, a, a security order for free. So stay tuned for how we did it. OK, quick recap of side channel attacks. Side channel is um, a physical effect that is um, for example, a processor which is uh, performing some execution, for example, here XORing a sensitive value X with uh, a value P. Um, executing this instruction on a device causes a certain power consumption, and this power consumption is data dependent due to the charges involved in a processor. And then an adversary is able to measure this power consumption and observe data-dependent power measurements. <coughs> For example, this also works with electromagnetic um, measurements. <coughs> and um, thereby launch side channel attacks, which allow to retrieve the sensitive value x here. Now, um, there is for teeth order side channel attack, which exploits T measurement samples, there's also teeth order masking, which works by um, taking the sensitive value x and producing multiple shares of it, splitting 
um, the, this original sensitive value x into multiple pieces x0, x1 to xt. And then there's provable security in the sense that in, in, in probing security we can say that no t observations um, may reveal on the secret and we can make a proof based on these shares that this is indeed the case. <coughs> now you can already observe that here it says observations and here it says measurement samples. So there is a difference between the two. And in our work, what we actually do is that we narrow the gap between these measurement samples and the observations by working in very fine-grained expressive leakage models. <coughs> so let's quickly look at how an algorithm looks like and an implementation of such an algorithm. To the left-hand side, we have a masked XOR gadget, which computes the XOR of the shares AI and BI sharewise. So it produces it takes a number of shares as input and it produces a number of shares as an output. And then usually this comes, this gadget, which performs an XOR computation, comes with a correctness proof saying, well, the gadget is computing an XOR of the shared values. And also with a security proof, which is, for example, in a probing model and specifies that um, for a number of observations in a specific model where, for example, A0 and B0 can be observed or the XOR sum could be observed and all the other sums can be observed as well, then no such um, observation set consisting of multiple uh, uh, such observations uh, is able to reveal the secret. <coughs> um, that's quite great because we have a provable secure um, algorithm here, but this algorithm does not execute on most devices, so there needs to be an implementation. This implementation can, for example, have to be on an assembly level. So the right-hand side we have the implementation, a uh, mass XOR and software, and this is quite different quite easy to observe that this is operating on shares which are stored in memory, these shares have to be loaded, then the X4 operation is looking quite different than, than um, actually here um, where there's a three address XOR and here um, the destination register is shared with an operand. And results have to be stored in memory. But moreover, the problem is that when this is executed on an actual device, then this might be provably secure, but that there's additional leakage behavior from the processor. So the processor executing this will perform additional combinations and allow additional values to be observed by an adversary. And this means that, for example, the store in this line will leak a combination of the value which is to be stored and the value which was stored in the last store instruction. This is very common on our Cortex M0 Plus device. And such effects also exist between loads, between ALU instructions. So for example, the R5 here and the R5 in line eight here. Um, uh, line eight, sorry, um, will be combined as well or possibly combined as well. And then the question is, does the proof still hold? And um, what we want to do is essentially to come up with verification techniques um, which allow to assess this in an automated manner. The countermeasure against is usually to insert, insert additional instructions um, to, to prevent these leakages. And this um, uh, is an overhead, right? Because we have ad additional instructions here and um, here. Um, which lead to an additional overhead and we want to minimize them and this is possible with our verification approach as well. So our approach to verify this is that we have a domain specific language which allows us to represent both the side channel behavior here of a specific device as well as a concrete implementation on assembly level. That is, we have a, mass, uh, we have a prototype tool which is called SCVerif and it takes a mask implementation, for example, in assembly format and it also takes as an input uh, semantic of the instructions, of the assembly instructions, as well as, side, as a side channel behavior um, specification of each of these instructions. And then um, this is used to represent um, the, this implementation and later on perform a check um, of the masking security based on the existing mask verif checker. Now, the problem is that Mask Verif and most other um, verification tools are not able to work on the level of assembly implementations, or, which are, for example, uh, using memory, um, or um, are incapable of uh, working in diverse leakage models and commit to a fixed leakage model or multiple different leakage models. 
So this is our, uh, our approach, and I will go through the different stages of representation, the partial evaluation, and uh, later on our benchmark. <clears throat> okay, our first um, task is to represent the semantic and the sidechain behavior of an instruction. So take, for example, an uh, excellent instruction with three registers, a destination register and two operand registers here. And in the usual setting, in an implicit representation, it would be quite easy to specify the semantic, what it, this instruction does. Well, it will assign the destination register um, the value, the, the Boolean XOR um, of the two operand registers, Rn and Rm. But the problem is what is leaking here, and this is not clear and usually then deeply embedded into the language by specifying, for example, that every XOR operation will be observable by an adversary. Now we take a different approach. We make an explicit representation, that is, um, we have the same semantic specification here, um, but this is now leak-free. There's no side-channel observation in our formal um, world uh, possible here. This is completely free of observable um, side channel. Instead, we have additional statements to specify that a certain value is observable and has to be considered, for example, in the proof of masking. And this is the leak statement, which takes in the curly braces a number of expressions or values which are to be considered in the proof and which represent essentially uh, the capability of a physical adversary to measure something in the power tree. A very common model is the Hamming weight model, where the Hamming weight of the computation result is leaking. Now the problem is here now that we are specifying that exactly the Hamming weight is leaking, and this is a bit unfortunate because in reality this is rarely the case, and rather weighted Hamming weight or the most significant bit or something else, some other combination is leaking. Instead, in our models, we usually take the approach that we just leak um, the pure term that is the full result, all the bits involved in the XOR of Rn and Rm. And this now specifies all the different kinds of observables here. That is, this could be the most significant bit, this could be the least significant bit, this could be an arbitrary bit combination of this result. And this is much more um, realistic um, to what is happening in actual devices. The approach is not limited in the sense that we can also model transition leakages, for example. That is, we can just specify, well, the hemming distance between the value, which is stored in Rd prior the assignment, <coughs> and the, the value which is to be assigned is leaking. And again, this is not a very good idea because now we are specifying that exactly the Hamming distance is leaking, whereas we would maybe just say that some combination of the destination register's value, prior assignment, and the value which is to be assigned is leaking and has to be considered in the proof. Now this essentially with the two terms here allows a side channel probing adversary to observe two values at the cost of one probe for those who know about these terms. Um, given this ability to specify semantic and sidechain behavior um, in, in uh, independent form or somehow independent form, we can now very easily construct models of individual instructions. That is, we just define a macro in our language which has the name of an instruction and takes its operands and performs the semantic operation of it and also contains a few annotations of what is leaking. An example here, the transition, as again, with the Hamming distance. Given uh, the model of several of such instructions, it is very easy to represent the disassembly of a larger program um, that is in disassembly, or represent an entire program, that's what I wanted to say. Um, so if you look at a line of a disassembly, then this usually comes with an address of a certain assembly instruction um, and the actual disassembled uh, assembly instruction, its name and its argument. Now, in our representation of low-level programs, this becomes very easy, just the definition of a label and um, the, the actual XOR representation, that is this macro definition here to the left, applied to the arguments given above. So it's very simple, but it's very powerful in the end, because our language is quite simple. It has a few 
uh, control flow construct like if then else, uh, while loops, um, and uh, features labels and gutters to to mention to to make the modeling of uh, assembly um, uh, jumps uh, possible. But apart from this, it's quite really simple. And all of this, you know, it's important to know that all of this, the entire language here, is free of leakage. That is, it does not specify any side channel behavior, with the sole exception of this leak statement. Only the leak statement is able to express that the uh, uh, adversary is able to see or to observe some information. Um, the, the small language, despite being so small, um, allows to really represent an entire instruction set architecture, of, for example, the Cortex M0 plus, um, including flags um, for carry, overflow, and, and so on, which are used to uh, express, for example, control flow operations in ARM assembly. So the goal of our language and of this model is to represent assembly instructions and to model the leakage of execution of a program. And we can do this by just specifying, for example, that there are global variables R0 to R12, which represent the global registers. And there's also a program, point, program counter, um, um, yeah, which mimics the program counter and the flags. Then we can move over, and this is again our XOR instruction as we have seen it before, and model how this XOR instruction behaves in terms of the semantic in line 9 and its leakage behavior, which is going to appear up here. We have already modeled the transition leak, but actually there's more um, leakage behavior of this XOR instruction in, pr in practice. So maybe the most relevant is the revenant leakage effect, which is a generalization of a behavior we have observed multiple times. That is, if you have two XORs in a sequence and they operate on certain data, um, then what we see in practice is that in, during the execution of the second XOR, there's a combination of the values which were used as an operand in the prior execution, uh, prior instruction. That is, in this instruction, there's a combination of C and A leaking, and the same on the right-hand side with B and D. And we can express this quite easily by introducing additional state, global shadow registers, we denote it usually as leaked state, um, and specifying that in this instruction, for example, the, values A, the value A is um, cached in of in this global register op A, and then in this instruction here, we actually have a leak of op A in combination with this operand C. And we specify this with an abstraction here, that is, we have a small helper macro, which we denote emit revenant leak, which takes the leakage state and the value um, which is leaked in combination, and then will always leak first the combination of the two and then assign the, this um, um, leakage state, the new value that is in this XOR, you would have the case that op A would receive the new C. Um, then we can annotate our XOR again with this and we get a more complete model. Um, in our case, we actually specified an additional worst case assumption, a leak of all these four values at the cost of one single probe that is an adversary is able to observe any combination of those four values here. In the end, we come up with a leakage model which is um, uh, sufficiently complete for our use cases and specifies the side channel behavior of X or and load and store, where load and store actually need to um, use one additional leakage state um, uh, each. And this model is then in the end sufficient to achieve side channel resilience and TVLA up to 1 million traces. But before we go into the results, let's briefly look at the automated verification. What I've shown you before was this stage of mask uh, SCVRIF, which was the representation of a mask concrete implementation, say again, assembly here, in a specific leakage model and for specific instructions. Now we have a representation which is in our domain specific language and only in this one, only using those constructs. And it turns out that mask verif, the checker we want to use, is using a strict subset of EEL. So we have a 
additional stage in between the, these two where we actually remove all these language constructs in EEL which are not able, um, which, are, which most graph is not able to understand. And this is performed by a partial evaluation. You might also know it under the name symbolic execution. And then we have this partial evaluator which is able to remove all these constructs and perform the symbolic execution. All we have to do is to preserve the side channel behavior and this is quite easy because this is this dedicated leak statement which we have just to pre-reserve. Um, there's some limitation here because partial evaluation actually requires um, some identification and it's also in general not complete. In the end we have a proof of concept tool which is called SCBRIF. This is able to verify masking security of concrete implementations um, uh, on assembly level um, using user-provided leakage models and semantics of instructions. And there the verification stage or the verification tool as mask verif is completely decoupled from the leakage behavior um, which is provided or specified by the user. Um, this SCVRIF tool is able to, to verify in a certain uh, number of um, security definitions, for example, non-interference and strong non-interference, but we also came up with our own um, uh, security definition, which is stateful strong non-interference or stateful non-interference. And this is one refinement of non-interference in the sense that we actually ensure that there is no residue left after the execution of a gadget. And that means that if we turn back to our original gadget um, XOR, then after the execution ends, um, all registers have to be cleared, which might, cont might have contained sensitive data. That is, here the contents of R4, R5, and R6 um, are purged um, to remove all shares which might be contained in this. And this greatly helps to uh, construct larger compositions. So we have used our tool to evaluate um, how well it performs and we have actually implemented two um, present S boxes or multiple different um, uh, versions of a present S box masked at first order using two, two shares to say and masked at second order using three shares. Our goal was always to reduce overhead as much as possible by, for example, removing those dummy instructions which had to be inserted, but also by coming up with new combinations of gadgets to come up with new gadgets to say um, to reduce the overhead. And this um, really worked well in the sense that um, we have been able in our first order implementation um, um, to uh, compare to the composition approach. So the composition approach is that you develop for each primitive operation one gadget and then you compose them together um, where we have our optimized approach which might combine multiple operations into one gadget. Um, we have been able to reduce the overhead massively to just 40% of the original implementations. So this is a fair comparison because this one is actually like a hardened implementation and this one as well. So this one is, so this approach is the one we usually take because it's so much effort to harden an implementation that we don't want to um, perform specific compositions or specific new gadgets and do more work than necessary. But here with our verification approach, we are really able to explore more optimization strategies because the verification approach it's really helping us to come up with implementations which are then later on practically resilient as we expected just with a verification tool which has a much faster response time. Um, so in total we've, we've been able to save a lot of dummy instructions on first order was 72 percent and in second order it was 86 percent and also the ratio of dummy operations um, and uh, semantic operations which are actually needed goes down quite a lot. And what we can observe is as well that in a second order setting where we have our optimized constructions, actually the number of cycles we need is less due to our optimizations than what you would expect from the composition approach um, at first order. That is we gain an entire security order for free by using our verification technology and our optimized composition strategies. We have performed a lot of physical evaluation, um, both at first and second order TVLA. We're using one million versus one million traces, so quite a lot of traces on two devices with multiple implementations. In the end, what we can say is that there appears to be some completeness of our model, which we have shown in the paper. 
That is, there is a link between provable security and the fact that every provable secure implementation of our final model um, has no leakage detected anymore in uh, physical evaluation. Clearly, this is an empirical link, which we cannot prove and which might be wrong for different uh, other settings. This is true for our devices, for our implementations, for our instruction, uh, set, architect instruction set architecture subset and our model. Um, but it's quite, um, quite cool to see that this actually works out and that we have in general the ability to come up with models which are so complete. On the other hand, our models are also not overly conservative in the sense that they are quite precise and whenever we remove proof relevant countermeasures, then there's also leakage detected. There's a lot more to be found in the paper. I hope you enjoyed this presentation and you can ask all the questions in the live session at Chess. Thanks a lot.